So we are going to ask one of the fundamental questions of faith this morning. Uh, this is a story that Jesus is going to tell that some of you have probably heard. It's called the Good Samaritan. And he tells this story in response to a question that he's asked. The question is so fundamental to the soul of anyone who's truly seeking this relationship with God or an interaction with spirituality in a way that means something beyond a, a routine or something beyond just a, a, a little service that we do, but deep, impactful relationship with God. How do we get it? What does it look like? And here's how the story starts. We'll start in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? There it is. There's that question of the soul. What do I do as a person to actually have something more than just the here and now of my soul? How do I go beyond the physical even? What does it mean to be alive spiritually? How do I enter into eternity? If there is an eternal God, how do I interact with him in that way? It's a deep and meaningful question. And what Jesus says to him in verse 26 is, what is written in the law? What is your reading of the law? Now, why does Jesus say that? When we hear the word lawyer, because that is the person that stood up, the description of the man who's asking the question is he is a lawyer. It's different than the way we think of lawyer in our day. We think of like the Matlock character, the person that's going to stand in the courtroom and there's a prosecutor and there's a, a defense attorney and they're battling for justice between each other in a courtroom. But in first century Judaism, and someone who would be described as a lawyer was really no more. It was a simple description of someone who was an expert in the law or an expert in the Torah, which are the first five books of the Jewish Bible. It is where the law lives. And someone who has become an expert in studying that and trying to understand how it plays out in someone's life would be called a lawyer. And so this man comes to Jesus and say, how do we have life? Jesus, knowing that he's an expert in the law, says, well, what's your reading? What do you think? How do you find life according to your law? And this was a very important question for the, the first century Jew. For us, you might think of yourself at, at what, what would be a funeral. And the question on people's hearts at a funeral in a Christian setting is, did they accept Jesus? That's where we have our life, in Jesus, who gives life and life more abundant. And when we think about the meaning of someone's life, the question we ask is, did they put their faith in the Savior? Did they put their life under the Lordship of Christ? For, for these people, it was, did they become a Torah Jew? Did they love the law? Did they try to live it out? And for that person, the question is, how, how do I know that I've done it? How do I know that I've become someone who is living according to the law? And this is what the expert of the day says. In verse 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And this is, in the Gospel of Matthew, the same summary of the law that Jesus gives. Simply put, that if you tried to understand the entirety of the law, the heart of the message with God giving commandments to people on the way that they're supposed to live, it can all be summarized into two basic pillars of the law. First, that you love God with everything that you have, with your mind and your soul and your whole being, that you have this deep intimacy with God that is qualified as love and worship and devotion. That in all the commandments of the law, they're pointing you to a love and a devotion to God. The second thing, very importantly, is that your love is so real and intimate with God that you become someone who reflects Him. We are made in the image of a loving God, and when you truly have intimacy with him, you begin to act like he acts. You begin to think and to care about people the way that he does. And so the way that the law is played out in a life-giving way is that you love God to such a way that you become an imitator of him into the sphere of influence of your life, and you begin loving people. This is the answer that the expert, the lawyer, gives. Now Jesus says, you've answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. Do this, and you will live almost can become a problem passage for those of us who believe in this gift of grace. Because Jesus sounds like he's endorsing salvation in the law. If you can fulfill the law, you would have life in loving God and loving people. But here's where the, the problem passage gets unpacked. Because the following verse, it says something in this lawyer's heart that is true of every one of us in wanting to justify himself. 
that if there was a way that we could put these boundaries in, in the in the interpretation of what it means to love God and to love people so that we could really do it. If you could just give us the exact boundaries, tell us who our neighbor is. And that's exactly the question the expert asks. He says, well, who's my neighbor then? Because if I'm going to fulfill life by doing well, if I'm just going to do good on my own, you have to tell me who my neighbor is. Isn't that sometimes how we think when we try to justify our own goodness? I want to be a good person. I want to know who I have to care about. I want to know who I'm free to not think about. And the lawyer wanting to justify himself is looking for boundaries in the way that he has to love his neighbor. And the question of the hour now, and the reason that we're on this text, is because who is my neighbor is something that Jesus will unpack in such a way that disqualifies all of us from thinking that we can just do the law on on our own. Jesus had a completely different heart for what it means to love people. His answer is surprising. We live now in the midst, in the, in the week behind us and the week ahead, of a classroom of how we can answer this question. Who is our neighbor in Boise, Idaho, in the midst of a storm? When there is hardship and challenge and difficulty and trouble all throughout the circumstances of our lives and the, and the, the city that we live in, we ask the question, what does it mean to love people? What does it mean to worship God in, in so in intimate, in such a way that we overflow our love for him into the lives of people, looking for life in the way that God has, been, has created us to live by loving him and then finding people that would qualify as our neighbor to show the love of God to? We now spend the, the duration of this sermon looking at the answer Jesus gives. Because Jesus wants to to break people free from this desire to justify ourselves or to look at the law as a way to, to, to give our own righteousness a case to stand on. What he's saying is love starts when you think differently about people. He's going to lean in and tell a story. Don't you love how Jesus does that? When, when there's a question proposed, proposed to him in the gospel or someone has this way they're trying to get answers from him, he says, let me tell you a story. It's almost like gathering children around and we're supposed to have faith like a child. And he says, if, I, if you can just grasp this concept through story, then you'll understand what I'm telling you. And so I love this because right now we're in our cabin. We're in the sanctuary. We're having our winter retreat right here in Boise, Idaho. And we're going to tell a little story. It's the story that is sometimes called the Good Samaritan. Jesus tells it, remember, answering the question, who is my neighbor? How can I be someone who shows the love of God to the people of my life? In verse 30, Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed him, leaving him half dead. We pause. This is a strange description of the way love usually starts in the way that we think about it. Because for us, love can be such an emotion, can't it? We think of love in the easiest terms that it comes to in the way that we have a love uh, template given to us through a family or that when we think about people that we want to grow closer to, people that we have deep and meaningful friendships with, maybe a guy or girl that you have really liked from afar and you can't wait to fall in love. It's such a great process. And we think about the Hollywood version of love and it's emotional and it's exciting and it goes through this process of glamour until you're finally in love with the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. But Jesus, when he talks about what love is, he starts the story with tragedy. He starts a story telling about a person who is going on his way and he was robbed and left for dead. This is the beginning of love. So the, again, when we think about the classroom of our city right now, what it means to love people, we know that if you have just thought about your past week trying to Go on your own ways. This story starts with traveling gone wrong. I love that because we can relate to that right now. There's some real application in that. There's so many of you that have probably had your own experience of getting stuck in a ditch somewhere or not being able to move. For the high schoolers and junior hires and the kids among us, we were so concerned with your travel safety, we we canceled school. Amen? We were excited to, to keep you home because we knew that travel could be dangerous. And all of that is small little pictures of the way frustration 
and disappointment and despair is all over right now. And when we begin to look at all of those circumstances with the eyes of Jesus, what we see is that in hard times, the gospel gets turned up. It's tragedy and difficulty and broken hearts and ways that life goes way different than what you were planning or expecting. And it's in those moments as says, this is the beginning of the story. Jesus says, this is the beginning of the story for how you can begin to love people. And so we look around our city right now. We look around even this sanctuary right now. And in whatever way this current storm has amplified your frustration, it has also amplified your ability to receive and accept and know the comfort of God and the love of God. And for whatever way that we live in neighborhoods and in a city where travel has gone wrong, and it goes way beyond travel. If you just think about the circumstances of our city right now, we live in a city where there's a homeless population. It's very difficult to be homeless right now. It's cold, and it's wet, it's freezing, and it's hard. These people have frustration turned up, but they also have the, uh, the openness. The open door to the gospel is being turned up all throughout our city. There's tragedy that's happening. There's people that can't leave to go get food. There's people that can't make it to work. There's people that are stuck in their homes or they're thinking about power outages or, or things that are going to happen to their homes. And in the way frustration gets turned up, Jesus starts the story by saying, this is where love can start. This is where we can start showing what it looks like when people who believe in God want to find life not just in worshiping him, but also fulfilling the second and greatest commandment in loving people. Tragedy. We love it as believers. We look for it. We, we, we want it to happen so that we can have opportunity to show that we believe in a God of hope who has risen people up to be laborers in the field to help out. And this is where the story is going to go now. What happens to this man who is stuck, left for dead? Jesus is going to introduce three people. We've got someone who's been robbed and left for dead, and now there's going to be three people. We're going to look at each one of them. The first two are warnings. To anyone who wants to answer the question, who's my neighbor, you start with a warning of what not to do. It starts by the, the first opportunity that someone has to help. They see him laying there. In verse 31, it says, Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, here's the chance. Here's the opportunity. There's someone who sees tragedy. He passed by on the other side of the road. And I want to stop there to try to draw out the first warning that we are supposed to learn when we truly want to start asking the question, who's my neighbor? The first response given is they, there's a man passing. He's given the chance to look at the tragedy that's befallen this man, and he goes to the other side of the road. Now, what's going on in the telling of the, the reaction to this? There's a really simple thing that he does, but it does a very big problem. It creates a very big problem, that's this. So often, what we can do in our reaction to not help, but to feel okay about it, is to create a barrier. Big, small, multiple. What we do in our, in our uh, a desire to not help, or desire to just keep going on our way, to not be inconvenienced, is we try to create something between us and the people that God puts in our life that we could be helping. See, we, we think that if you can create a barrier, you remove responsibility on your part. And the more barriers that you have, the less responsible you are. So in this case, it was just a small bit of distance. I don't want to get near. If I get too close to him, I'd be so close that I'd have to help him. So I'm going to go to the other side of the road, and now I feel better because I'm removed. I'm distant from him. And there's all sorts of ways that we can put things up in our lives that seem almost seemingly okay. But what they're really doing is creating distance between us and people who need the practical needs of life met. Let me give you an example of my own life as a moment of confession in the way that I get convicted in this. And as I share this, this is not in any way a template for how we are supposed to help every person holding a sign on the corner of our city. In any way that we are prompted to help, it has to be a yielding of the Holy Spirit, a yielding to what God is doing in positioning us in our lives. We, we have to act in wisdom. But as God gives clear open door opportunity, we have to respond. And what I do sometimes in my route of life, but we all have roads that we travel more often than others, and in my route, I've come to know where the certain corners are. And you probably know them in your own route from work or home or school or back. We have certain corners we know there's going to be people. And I have caught myself doing this, that as I approach a certain 
certain corner and my window has been rolled down because it was a nice day and I'm catching a breeze. As I approach that corner, I'll catch myself just slowly rolling that window up. Slowly rolling that window up to create a small but effective barrier for me to create a, just a one wall of separation from me and interaction. And there's other ways that I can do it too. I, in, in my own way, and this isn't even always conscious, but as I walk around and I see people who just need help, can I have a couple extra bucks? And they have all their reasons, but they're poor people. God calls us to help poor people. And you know what I often do? Oh, man, I don't carry any cash. All I've got is card. And I can even offer a, a very shallow apology. So sorry, I don't carry cash. Now, how, how hard would it be for me to change that? That's a barrier that I create, knowing that because I don't have cash, I don't have to give. And in, these are two small ways with very specific examples of someone who's poor and needy, but we do it all throughout our life. We think that distance is a sufficient barrier, that it, was, it, was, it happened so far away, I really can't help that person. We think that uh, lack of relationship is a sufficient barrier. I don't really know that person. I know, they look like they're hurting. They look like they're in despair, but I don't even know their name, so I'm just going to trust that someone else can help them. We have to be very mindful mindful of the way that we try to go to the other side of the road to avoid people who are hurting and broken. Jesus is so practical. He says, look what the first guy did. He goes to the other side of the road. What are the barriers of your life? What are the ways that you have created a life that keeps you inside your own little world of comfort and your own little world of being very protected in the way that you really would never have to step out to help someone? Be mindful of the way that we sometimes cross the street to avoid the way that God wants to use us to meet the needs of someone who's desperate for help. That's number one. There's barriers that we put in place to remove responsibility. How can we get those out? How can we be practical? in the way that we help people. The second thing is this. There's a, there's a second opportunity now. The priest has passed by in verse 31. In verse 32, it says, Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked, and he passed by the other side. So we have a double warning here. There's two people that did it. There's something that they think they're re removing themselves from proximity, removes themselves from responsibility. Jesus is giving a double warning that these are not good examples of people who are loving their neighbor. But there's a second thing I want to pause here to look at. And it has to do with the title that Jesus uses. The, the, the description of these men. This is a, the, the, this men. These are parables. These are very pointed descriptions that Jesus is using as part of the point that he is making for the story. We've had two people so far, and the descriptions given to them by Jesus are very important. The first one was a priest. The second was a Levite. Now, priest, you know the name. We still use it in the, in the, in the way that we have religious talk today. It's kind of a servant of the church or a leader. Uh, Levite is the, is the same way when you understand the context of the first century. The, the, a Levite comes from the tribe of Levi. Remember, there's 12 tribes of Israel, and each one gets a portion of the land, except for the Levites. The tribe of Levi doesn't get any portion of the promised land because God says they belong to me. They're mine. They just serve me. They don't get any land, but all the other tribes will tithe and offer offerings to them because they're doing my work. The entire job of the tribe of Levi was to do ministry. So a priest has to come from the tribe of Levi. And all the other Levites that aren't priests are still called to serve in some way in all of the religious duties of their day. So initially the tribe of Levi was in charge of setting up and tearing down the tabernacle. And as the land got established and the temple was built, they were temple workers. They always did things to honor God with their lives. So what Jesus is saying is these are two ministry leaders and they've entirely missed the point. They're people that are supposed to be a representation of God to the people, a representation of the people to God, and they are missing the point of what it means to love people. This is not simply a, a call against ministry leaders. Certainly, this is a, a check for anyone who is part of ministry to remember to stay true to the heart of God. But it's also to say this. If the leaders of the day were missing what it meant to love people, how much more are the people that are following the leaders? How much more are the ones that they're leading, they're leading astray? If they're doing it, the people they're teaching are missing it. He says, listen, ministry can be a distraction at times. There are things that we do in the calendar of church. There's things that we do in the name of our own rhythm of ministry that sometimes misses the way the Spirit of God is moving in the real and now. 
And the way I even came to that conclusion is it just happened to me Saturday morning. So I want to give you some insight in how I kind of prepare to do a sermon. Throughout the week, I'm praying, I'm processing the word, and I'm scratching notes on a journal, and I just kind of continually process. And on then Saturdays is the day that I kind of galvanize. I put it all together. So for me, the, the, the beginning portion of the week is like gathering all the ingredients, and then Saturday is put it in the oven. That's when I put the sermon in the oven, and I wait to see what comes out, right? And then Saturday night and Sunday, we eat. We feast off the word. So Saturday morning I come to, to that portion. This is the day. I've got the ingredients in the grocery shop. I'm going to go cook a meal. And as I'm leaving, my wife says, hey, real quick, there's some real heavy snow that's coming again. And I say, okay. And she's like, so we should probably take some necessary steps to get ready for that and think about what that means. And I'm thinking, okay. She's like, yeah, we, we could definitely use some more food. And I'm not sure I could get out. This house hasn't been shoveled at all. So what's your plan for all that? And I said, today is ministry day. Today is the day I work in the sermon. That will all have to wait until Sunday afternoon. And she's like, okay. And I'm walking away and it's like, what, what, what am I doing? There's a storm coming. There's a state of emergency. There's needs of the household. And yet I'm so in tune to my own schedule of ministry that I'm just going to neglect all that and get to it come hell or high water Sunday afternoon. So what am I doing? And so I, I stopped myself. The Lord's just speaking to me like, what was that? You're so concerned about me speaking to you about a message that you're just going to leave your wife in a state of emergency? So I come back, and I'm begrudgingly shoveling, <laughs> shoveling the sidewalk. I get up on the roof. I'm scraping stuff off, and I'm thinking, Lord, I've missed it. And in the same way that I was so concerned with my own schedule, I was so concerned with the schedule of our church. That what my heart was is I wanted to talk about prayer and fasting because in two weeks we're going to be praying and fasting. I want to encourage people and exhort people in the importance of this so that we would all come and just cry out to God in one voice and he would move and there would be a stirring of his spirit. And I was so concerned with where we're going as a church that I'm crossing the other side of the road and missing the real-time needs of the city that we live in. That we live in a city that is going to have some major needs opening up. Some doors of ministry are going to open up through people going through frustrating and hard times. How are we speaking to that? How are we mobilizing the hands and feet of Jesus in this congregation so that the city of Boise knows there's a God who has caused some dead people to come alive and those people just want to tell everyone of the hope they have in him. And they want to help people. And so in my life, in the leading of this church, the Lord had to say, wait a second. Don't be so focused on two weeks from now that you miss what I'm doing right now. And in your own life, we all have to ask ourselves, what is the rhythm of my life? Am I more committed to a calendar than I am to the Holy Spirit? Am I more focused on where I'm going in three months than what God is doing right here in the neighborhood, in the family, in the job that I have right now? Let's, let's allow God to open our eyes to the way that he wants us to be helping people in real time. And so these are the two warnings now. How are we people who are creating barriers in our life so that we can remove responsibility? And how are we people that are so involved in the church calendar that we're missing the real-time ways that God wants to do things outside of these four walls? Just things to pray about, things to be open to. And again, this is just a classroom. This week ahead, when you see those cars out on the road or when you see neighbors that are trying to shovel and they just don't have the right stuff, any way that you see someone in need this week, we have an awesome classroom of, of application ahead. And so now we look at the good example. Because those are the warnings. Now what does it look like in, in this third person that Jesus presents? What does it look like to love people the way Jesus tells we should love? Love people. And this is what he said in verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. I want to pause right here. And before we get into the example set by this good Samaritan, or as Jesus calls him, a certain Samaritan, I want to kind of tell you the model of the way Jesus tells stories in these ways. There is all sorts of parables that he tells, but in a lot of his parables, he talks about people or things in need. And we see this now. This story starts with someone who's in desperate need of help. He's been robbed and he's left for dead. What's going to happen? And in other ways, Jesus has this way of speaking into tragedy of life. 
There is a story in Luke 15 that Jesus tells in response to the way people say he's hanging out with too many fringe people. He's hanging out with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. And in response, he says, let me tell you a story. He leans in and he gathers around. And he says, there was a sheep and it was lost. And sheep, when they're lost, are just awaiting imminent peril. There's nothing they can do to save themselves. And then he tells another story. And he says there was this son, and he was lost. He took all his money, and he went to this far-off land, and he spent it all. He wasted his money, and then the land had a famine or a lack of food, and he started to starve. And then there's a change in the story. There was, a, there was a man who was traveling, and he was robbed, and he was left half dead. And then there's a change in the story. And so I want to speak now to two people specifically, and you're one of them right now. The first person is the person that needs to know that there is tragedy in life, that sometimes you are lost Sometimes you have spent all your money and had a dead end and you don't know what to do with your life. There are times when you have your heart ripped out and you feel robbed and you feel cheated and you feel betrayed. And Jesus speaks in all of these stories so that the person that's in that circumstance knows that the story isn't over. That might be you right now. You might be more identifying with the person that's been robbed and left for dead than the person that's going to offer the help. You might identify more with a lost sheep than you do with someone who's praising and worshiping God right now. If you're a lost son or daughter, if you feel like you don't know what you're doing with your life, Jesus has a story for you, and the story isn't over because there's always a second act. There's always something that comes. There's another character that comes into the story, and that's the second person I want to talk to now. The lost sheep is really a story about a good shepherd who's going to leave 99 sheep behind to go find that one that's lost and bring him home into the comfort and the safety of the fold. The lost son is really a story about a loving father, although the son totally left his family and totally lived his life however he wanted. The father waits him and greets him and loves him as soon as he gets home and doesn't hold anything against him. And there's this story now of a second act where there is a good Samaritan. There's someone who wants to care for the person who's been left for dead. And in all of the second act, what we're supposed to see initially is Jesus himself. Jesus is the good shepherd. He came to be the good shepherd. To take anybody who was lost, if you put your faith in him, he will shepherd your life. He will lead you to green pastures and still waters. He is the good father. There's nothing you can do to separate yourself from, from the love of Christ. There, no matter how far or, or crazy your life has gone from where it's supposed to be, there is always a loving Savior waiting to welcome you home. And Jesus is that good Samaritan. He will find someone who's been robbed and left for dead and cheated. He will bandage their wounds and he will put them back to, towards life. And in that, as sure as you can see Jesus, there is also someone that is happening to take you from that lost sheep and that lost son and that robbed person. And Jesus is shaping in us to be the second person ourselves. If you've put faith in Jesus, if you believe that he's the good shepherd of your life, he wants you to join the story. He wants you to be inspired by the person that comes and helps. He wants us to follow him. He wants to make us disciples in the way that he treats people. So we look at this with hope that Jesus is this in our life. For the way that our soul and our spirit is downtrodden, he will bandage us and clean us up, and he does it all so that we can imitate him in this. There's inspiration that's supposed to be happening here. So let's look at three things now, three things that this certain Samaritan does to fulfill what Jesus says is loving your neighbor. The first thing is this. In verse 33, as Jesus introduces the character, it says, he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He looks, he sees someone beaten, downtrodden, left for dead, and instead of going to the other side of the street, he has compassion. There's something that has been moved in his heart. Compassion means very simply, it's important for you to understand what it means because it's something that we're called to have to suffer with. To see someone's state of being, the condition that they're in, the tragedy that they find themselves in, and actually suffer with them. To feel the pain that they feel. To go inside to help them because you care deeply for them. And this is an important point to make. That we, as people who want to fulfill the command to love God and love people, have to have compassion. Because there's a danger that this whole sermon could be misinterpreted as a duty. 
that we are people that come to church and the next step in the program is to be fulfilling a duty to love people. And we do it not because we have compassion, but because we want to justify ourselves. We want our church experience to be going according to the, the, the next step in the program, which means after you get saved, you just start being a nicer person. Now, if you are hearing a message full of duty, you need to hold on to this word compassion. And here's how it becomes more real in your life. When we read the first and second commandments of the law, the pillars of the law, to love God and love people, they are in a specific order. They do not come in random order. We don't start loving people as a way to care more about God. It starts by loving God with everything we are, and then in abundance of our love for him, we begin to imitate him. We begin to fulfill our the initial design of creation to be reflections of his image. And this is important for the word compassion because in all the ways we experience the love of God, it is because he has compassion on us. The Bible says we love God because he first loved us. The Bible says salvation is a prompting from the love of God. God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And we are not saved by works of the law, but it is by grace apart from works, lest anyone should boast. The salvation, the relationship that we have with God is according to the love with which he loved us. And the worship that we have in our pursuit of him is all in a desire to have a deeper revelation of his love for us. Your sins are forgiven because he has compassion for you. You have newness of life in the person of Jesus because of the compassion of God to put Jesus in your place to take on the punishment of sin and to raise Jesus from the grave to offer newness of life. It has nothing to do with we've, what we've done. And when we understand the great compassion that God has for us, we begin to have compassion on people. It cannot be missing from the equation as we think about how we can help people practically. The second thing is this. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring oil and wine and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. We have this beautiful picture now of instead of running away from the person, going to the other side of the road, we see this man who begins to take care of the open wounds so practically. Where there is cuts, where there's blood, he begins to clean it with oil and wine. He begins to bandage it to stop the bleeding. He then takes him from the place that he's at, and he brings him to shelter so that he can be nursed back to health. And what I want to say very simply is the second thing that we can learn from this is that Jesus teaches that love is very practical. That winning people over for the power of God does not always come, or maybe even very rarely comes, through an argument of theology. So often when we think about what it means to be a soul winner, what it means to reach people for Christ, we think about well-crafted sermons or well-rounded arguments or logic that can convince people in the being of God, in the resurrection of Christ. All of those are so important and they're so valid, but Jesus teaches such a practical love. Jesus says, here's a need and here's someone who met it. Here's something that is happening in real time in this person's life. And before any theology happens, before any talk of inviting someone to church or trying to figure out where they stand and how they're going to respond to your help, there is some practical needs that are being met without a word, without an agenda. And so the second thing, as I pray we become a church that is so full of compassion, where the Lord opens up the eyes of our heart to see the needs of our community, we also become people who go so deep into the practical. It's not just about bringing people to church so they can hear a sermon. There are some practical needs that can be met. I made a list of them, again, just for the, the, the week ahead. This is a sermon that goes so far beyond a storm. But for the week ahead, here's some things that could be very practical for us as believers who want to be motivated to live like Jesus. I want us to be mobilized as the hands and the feet of Jesus in this community. If there's a state of emergency, I pray that God has access to all his peoples that can rally around the people in need. Here's some basic things. If you you have extra stuff, and by stuff I mean hats and gloves specifically, put them in the glove box. As you see people who are out there shoveling their, their sidewalk or trying to push a car, trying to walk to work, if they're not wearing a hat or gloves, we should be people who are ready to give. 
And for me, it's real easy. I don't have to run to the superstore to get all the gloves on the rack. God has blessed my family. I have a drawer full of hats, and I have a drawer full of gloves. And I could, during my spring cleaning, clean house and take it to the thrift store, or right now I can put some in the glove box, and I'm ready. Anytime I see some cold ears or some cold hands, I can pull over and hand somebody some practical needs to show the love of God to them in that moment. What gets said after that, if there's a prayer, if there's a gospel presentation, I allow the Holy Spirit to prompt me and to open up the doors for that, but we start so practically. Here's another thing. Carry some cash on you. This is something that I already mentioned as a barrier that I've presented for my own life, but it, why not have a couple bucks, maybe two fives and five dollars worth of ones, that when we see somebody who's cold, see somebody who's just asking for a little extra help, two dollars will buy a coffee, and a coffee will warm the body. Even so, walking into a coffee shop and hanging out for an hour is a nice way to stay warm in the storm. If you have a couple bucks, you can give it to them, and you can trust that God will give them wisdom to go buy some coffee. And we do all of this yielding to the Spirit according to wisdom, but at least have it on us for when we see those people. Here's one that I needed just practically because I was in the grocery store parking lot. I run into two brothers and sisters of Christ that come to this church. They say, hey, our car won't start. Can we get a jump? It's going to happen. There's cold temperatures. The cars that uh, a lot of us have aren't made for these kind of weather conditions, and the batteries might start giving out. I didn't have jumper cables. I wish I had, but we, we asked some people, and eventually someone had. We, we could be all driving around. For any of you who have the jumper cables hanging in the garage, put them in the, in the trunk. And when you see a car with its hood up, you'll be ready to help. You'll be ready to be someone's help in the, in the time of need. Uh, for me, I, on the side, do Uber driving. I don't know if you've heard of Uber, but it's like an alternative to taxi. When I get the time to do it, I love it because it's a chance to meet people. And just, I have always dreamed of being a taxi driver, but that's a different story. Uh, but Uber sent me a, a notification this week, and it said, demand is through the roof. We're tripling our prices for drivers. And I just thought, oh, well, one, that's just so wrong. I mean, there are people in need, and so we're going to tra charge them three times as much. What about the believers? How about the people who just want to be used by God and do everyday kind of work of Jesus? If you've got a four-wheel drive car and you know somebody who doesn't have a ride, offer them a ride. Give them a chance to get to work or get to school or get to where they're going and just be that extra lending set of hands. Just be open to it. Um, now, there's two that are just really practical when it comes to sharing Christ and sharing the gospel. For those of you who are not evangelists, don't have the gift of preaching or teaching, this is, there's no agenda attached to this. No one that we help needs to come to Calvary Chapel, Boise. In fact, if you help someone that's on the other side of town and they're walking, I hope that you can pray that they find a good community church that they can walk to. This would not be a good church for someone who's walking around the North End. They need to be able to walk to where they're going. And so in all that we do, don't feel like one of the barriers is that you're just not spiritually gifted enough to have the conversation about the four spiritual laws. We actually don't see where this guy shared anything to do with his motivation. He just practically helped and practically needed. So where the gospel's of presentation is, is open, do it. Preach the gospel whenever you can. Always be prepared to give a hope that's within you. Share as much as you can in God's timing, but don't let a lack of sharing discourage you. We're just looking to help practically and let God do the, the, the ultimate fruit that will come from that. But, but two needs that can go with the, the spiritual invitation here is we've got free Bibles as part of the ministry of this church. Typically, people walk through the lobby, and if they don't have a Bible, they can grab one. But I'm inviting all of you, if you have been helping people, if you have a four-wheel drive car, if you know of a neighbor that's going to be stuck in their house, grab one of those free Bibles and get ready to pass it out. You never know how God could use that free Bible to speak to someone. And then finally, this is maybe the most important one because this applies to all of us. Everything else I've, I've, I've mentioned, there's going to be some of us that can help out and some of us who are just happy to be here. We got a ride or we walked ourselves. So for this one, we can all do this. And that is that there is one way that God has removed every barrier that we set up in our lives. In all the ways that we try to put barriers in or we see things as, as limitations on the way that we can help people, there's one thing that God gives us, a tool that God gives every one of us that removes every barrier, and that is prayer. 
Every single one of us can pray for the cold and the homeless and the needy and the frustrated and the lost and the hurting in our city. We can all do it. And one of the easy applications to this goes perfectly for something that the Lord put on the heart of our prayer team leaders is that we are now starting something called Pray 15. You'll see a sign for it in the lobby. And all it means is that we are a church that is going to try to mobilize in prayer so that we have 24-hour prayer happening around the clock. And so we have 15-minute time slots that you can sign up for. As an example, from 7 a.m. to 7.15 every day, you will pray for those 15 minutes. And we are trying to create a calendar of our church that we are always praying. Now, the good news for those of you who are thinking, I don't want that 3 a.m. shift because that would be hard. The beautiful way that God put this together is that our prayer team leader and Pastor Guna from India meet each other not long ago, and they both have this 24-hour prayer on each other's hearts. And they're both trying to figure out what to do at the, at the, uh, when the sun goes down, after everyone's sleeping. And what they realize is that when India is awake, we're sleeping and vice versa. So during our sunlight hours, we'll pray for a 12-hour period. And then during their sunlight hours, they pray. So in combination with the, the connection of ministry that we have with the Ministry of India, we'll be doing 15-minute increments from the, from the whole globe now. So if you are someone that just wants to commit to prayer, if you want to learn that discipline in your life, what it means to say every day, I'm going to pray for 15 minutes for the needs of our world and our city and our church church and my family and offer my just my heart to God, go sign up. I would love to have every slot triple filled. So practical things, Bibles, prayer, gloves, hats. This is for the week ahead, but pray about it for your own life. What does it mean to just practically help people once the snow melts? And once we're back to the conditions where there's no inconveniences in our city anymore and the open doors for the gospel aren't as apparent, what does it mean to practically love your neighbor, to practically be someone who's serving in the people's lives of your, uh, of your sphere? The final thing, it says in verse 35, on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii. He gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I'll repay you. We've got compassion, we've got practical needs, and we've got the third thing is that there is a sacrificial giving. That we cannot be people who only help in as much as it, in, as it is not an inconvenience to us. Even in the examples that we've shared and the ways that you'll have an ability to just practically help people this week, it will cost you some small things. It may cost you your warmth as you step out of your warm car. It may cost you your time as you spend 20, 30 minutes trying to help someone get to where they're going. It may cost you your normal route as you start giving people rides. But we cannot be people who are only willing to help in as much as it doesn't inconvenience us. Because when Jesus gives the answer, who's my neighbor? He says your neighbor is someone that is in desperate need and you're willing to offer something of your own thing to give them. It was his own animal that he put him on. He starts walking. He says, now you're riding my animal. I'm going to get you to this inn. And whatever need that you have at this inn, for the night stay, if there's extra bandages that you need, whatever food you have to give this guy, you put it all on my bill and I will come back to pay it. We do this because in all of these things, the compassion of this man, the practical needs of this man, and the self-sacrificial giving of this man, Jesus is a complete fulfillment of. Jesus had deep compassion on the people of his, of his day. As he walked around and saw the cities and villages lost and scattered like sheep without a shepherd, it said he was moved to compassion to help them. And he practically helped. He, he taught. He taught the word so they would have wisdom on how to live their lives. He healed them how, in, in every disease. And he dwelt among us. He came from his heavenly throne and dwelt among us, taking on flesh so that we could hear his words. We could see his perfect example. And then he did it all the way to the cross. Jesus says there's no greater love than this than for someone to lay down his life. And that's what he does. He gave us his life on the cross. He became unrighteousness so that we could become the righteousness of God. He took on our sin and our guilt and our shame at the price of his own life. And he says, follow me. He says, if you want to be my disciple, pick up your cross and live like I live. Follow me in that. If we want to love God, we have to be like Jesus. 
we have to be people who go beyond our comfort, who go beyond convenience, who go beyond even what we think we are willing to give so that we can live like Jesus in the way that we give all to love people. The story ends as Jesus asks a final question. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And the lawyer said this, he who showed mercy. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Do you want to know the fulfillment of loving God and then loving people, allowing his love to define you in a way that you love the people in your life? Show mercy. Be a help in time of need to people in your life. Know God's compassion so that it flows out of you to have compassion on other people. And don't set up the barriers of life so that you can live within your own little comfort zone, but allow his compassion and his mercy to overflow out of you, to rip down the barriers, and to help people who are in need. In doing so, we will love God. We will offer the sacrifice of worship to him in the way that we care for people because he loves them so much. So let's do it. This week, when the snow melts, we pray for a whole new wave of his spirit to open up our eyes into how we can continue to love the neighbors that we have in our lives in this city.